Muy buenas tardes, estamos próximos a comenzar con el seminario online ¿Cómo cambia la ciudad frente a las crisis? Así que espérennos, estamos a segundos y por favor no se pierdan esta muy interesante conversación que está próxima a, com a comenzar.
¿Cómo están? Muy buenas tardes y muy buenos días a quienes nos ven desde Australia. Estamos dando comienzo al seminario online ¿Cómo cambia la ciudad frente a las crisis? Tengan ustedes muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Rodrigo Gendelman, soy un periodista interesado y con un enfoque en el desarrollo de las ciudades. Y en nombre de la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción, la Embajada de Australia en Chile y la Cámara Chilena Australiana de Comercio, la USCHAM, les doy una cordial bienvenida al seminario online ¿Cómo cambia la ciudad frente a las crisis? Una pregunta que muchos nos estamos haciendo constantemente y trataremos de buscar algunas respuestas. Quiero agradecer a todos los socios de la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción, colaboradores y asistentes que han aceptado la invitación para compartir eh, esta, este encuentro eh, a través de la señal online www.cchc.cl streaming. Antes de comenzar, eh, quiero comentarles que el único medio para poder realizar preguntas es el WhatsApp que va a aparecer en pantalla. Quiero contarles que me acompañan esta tarde un grupo de personas de lujo. Patricio Donoso, presidente de la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción, Todd Mercer, embajador de Australia en Chile, Michael Rose, presidente del Comité de Sydney de Australia, Gabriel Metcalf, el CEO del Comité de Sydney en Australia, Paz Serra, la jefa de División de Desarrollo Urbano, la DDU del MIMBU, y Eduardo Minder, presidente de la Comisión Ciudad y Territorio de la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción. Quien va a dar inicio a esta jornada es Patricio Donoso, que nos va a entregar unas palabras de bienvenida. Quiero contarles, antes de que Patricio comience, que cuando empiecen ya los panelistas, todas las presentaciones van a ser en inglés, pero ustedes tienen la opción ahí en la página de poder ver la traducción simultánea. ¿Ok? Entonces, don Patricio Donoso, por favor, las palabras son suyas. Muchas gracias, Rodrigo. Estimados amigos, estimadas amigas, muy buenas tardes. Como decía Rodrigo aquí en Chile, muy buenos días en Australia. Sean todos bienvenidos a este webinar eh, que nos reúne con el objetivo de reflexionar e intercambiar opiniones sobre el desarrollo de nuestras ciudades. Un ejercicio que hemos estado realizando frecuentemente y que la contingencia sin duda nos invita a profundizar. Esta situación que enfrentamos deriva de esta pandemia global, es inédita para nuestra generación por sus efectos y alcances. Si bien conocemos experiencias de pandemias anteriores, a partir de los libros de historia, los cuales hemos tenido que rescatar, esta vez se presenta en un mundo distinto, en un mundo que está globalizado y con las ciudades como los principales motores de desarrollo, donde se concentra más de la mitad de la población, lo que hace la diferencia ante todo lo que ya era conocido. Así como los problemas de sanidad urbana influyeron eh, en las primeras normativas y modelos de desarrollo urbano a fines del siglo XIX y principios del siglo XX, la actual pandemia nos presenta nuevos desafíos en cuanto a cómo las ciudades responderán a esta crisis y al mismo tiempo cómo se convierten en instrumento de prevención y control de futuros potenciales contagios. Esto nos debe llevar a cuestionarnos diversos aspectos de los modelos de desarrollo urbano que ya conocemos, el más evidente es el rol que jugarán los procesos de densificación, dado el actual contexto, pero también las importantes desigualdades que aquejan a nuestras ciudades en términos de distribución de bienes públicos y accesos a las oportunidades de empleo y servicios, lo que más afecta los patrones de movilidad y las posibilidades de contagio de enfermedades. En el caso de nuestro país, en nuestro Chile, esta discusión cobra especial importancia dado que tenemos un sistema de planificación urbana que cuenta con instrumentos en muchos casos obsoletos y sometidos a procesos de actualización que todos conocemos, son muy extensos. Si bien la contingencia que enfrentamos como país y sector productivo nos obliga a abordar las urgencias del día a día, el actual momento reafirma nuestro compromiso como gremio con la generación de espacios de diálogo y reflexión, en este caso sobre el futuro de las ciudades, y los cambios que, tendrán, que se tendrán que introducir con miras a un desarrollo más sostenible. Sostenible en el amplio sentido de esa palabra. Esta es la invitación que hoy hacemos a todos quienes nos acompañan. Para ello, si tal como lo mencionaba Rodrigo, eh, contamos con dos expositores internacionales, Michael Rose y Gabriel 
Gabriel Metcalf, presidente y CEO del Comité para Sydney, respectivamente, institución que reúne a múltiples actores para aportar al desarrollo de una ciudad que entregue mejor calidad de vida a sus habitantes. Junto a ellos contaremos con la experiencia local, representada por Paz Serra, jefa de la División de Desarrollo Urbano del Ministerio de Vivienda y Urbanismo, y Eduardo Minde, presidente de la Comisión de Ciudad y Territorio de la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción. A todos ellos les agradezco por estar aquí y compartir con nosotros su experiencia. Quisiera también agradecer especialmente a los coorganizadores de esta actividad, me refiero a la Embajada de Australia en Chile, y en especial a su embajador Todd Mercer, de la Cámara Chilena Australiana de Comercio. Esperamos que la conversación e intercambio de ideas que aquí se produzca sea provechoso y nos ayude a lograr mejores ciudades y soluciones en beneficio de todos quienes vivimos en ella. Muchas gracias. Agradecemos las palabras de Patricio, que nos dan el, el marco, pero si voy a bajar un poquito el, el volumen porque tengo un acople, ahí sí que sí, nos dan el marco para iniciar esta, esta conferencia y en el mismo sentido quiero invitar a Todd Mercer, embajador de Australia en Chile, a compartir con nosotros sus palabras de bienvenida. Gracias, Rodrigo. Y antes que nada, quisiera darle las gracias a Patricio como presidente de la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción por sus palabras de bienvenida y por uh, trabajar con nosotros para organizar este evento que se ve súper interesante. Um, I might switch to English now. Um, I, I'd also just like to add to uh, Patri Patricio's comments and, and, and thank our friends from the Committee for Sydney, uh, Michael and Gabriel for, for participating today and, and for joining us nice and early your time in, in Sydney, my hometown, a city that I miss very much. Um, thank you also to, to Paz and Eduardo on, on the Chile side. Um, really looking forward to your contributions. And I'd like to thank everybody that's listening in, um, in into this, uh, this, what I'm sure will be very interesting conversation. Um, I've only been here since early February and the world has changed quite a lot in that time. Uh, I've previously lived in Chile, so that's a country I know quite well. Um, but I know that the embassy in recent years has worked very closely uh, with, um, together with Ostjam, um, with the Camera uh, on, a, on a series of, of events. Uh, for example, just last year when Chile was hosting APEC, um, our uh, assistant treasurer and minister for housing, Michael Suka, visited for the APEC finance ministers meeting and we hosted a breakfast um, and a number of participants in, in the event this morning, Pass and Eduardo, both, both participated in that breakfast. Uh, there was also a visit uh, by an Ostcham delegation um, to Australia in early last year, in April of last year. Again, Pass and Eduardo participated in, in, in that. Um, and we had the pleasure uh, of uh, a visit by Michael Rose um, in 2018 when he was invited to Chile by the, the Cámara to participate in your uh, Conferencia Internacional de la Ciudad. Uh, and, and that particular conference focused on the importance of an integrated approach to urban planning. Now, COVID-19 has obviously changed the world in, in the, over the past few months in ways uh, I, I don't think many of us could have imagined. Um, one, tonight is one small, this morning for those in Australia, is one, one uh, the latest example of how we're, we're needing to be flexible and, and, and ensuring that we can continue to do what we do and, 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 and making uh, the most of uh, you know, the digital means to get together. Um, but obviously for country, for all countries, but, uh, and, and, and Chile and Australia are no exceptions to this, COVID-19 is really placing a big strain on, on our health, health systems. Our economies are being very hardly hit and that has uh, consequences for, um, for employment and for the livelihoods of, of our people. And it's also having an impact on the day-to-day -day, um, routines that we each follow. And those of us that are in Santiago, again, from uh, Friday of last week, um, see that um, you know, we're, we're working in, in, in quite different circumstances. Now, cities in particular have been very, uh, very hard hit by COVID-19. Um, while they're responsible for much of the economic and social development that, uh, that we need to, to thrive and, and survive, by their nature, by the dense populations that they have, they, they are particularly vulnerable uh, to pandemics such as COVID-19. 
Um, now, we don't know what the future will bring, um, but we do know and we are seeing that uh, COVID-19 is, is, is requiring um, us to, to change our ways. And again, it is going to have sig significant implications uh, for our cities. Um, there's lots of questions um, that, 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 that occur to, to us. Um, I don't have any of the answers, I'm afraid, but um, what will cities look like going forward? And I'm sure these questions will be the subject of the discussion tonight. There's been a lot of talk about office space. Uh, will, will working remotely become the new norm? Uh, I've actually been really impressed at, at just how well my team at the embassy and, and, and Australian businesses that I deal with here and my Chilean counterparts here, just how well people are coping um, uh, in, in a very changed environment. But other areas like tourism, um, I was at, at the airport all last night um, getting some Australians um, home on a flight and there was lots of discussion among people there about what this, um, what COVID-19 means for tourism and international travel going forward and, and other things like sports events and other and, and public spaces. So um, I'm sure these are issues which will be uh, discussed in, in some detail and they're particularly relevant for countries like uh, Chile and Australia. While we are very, um, we have uh, large spaces. Uh, Chile is a very long country. Australia is very long and wide, um, but we're also a very urbanised population. So in the case of Chile, I think it's 88% 88 uh, 88 of the population um, resides in cities. In, in the case of Australia, it's 86%. Um, and we have in Australia two very large cities, or for us anyway, Melbourne and Sydney are over 4 million. In Chile, you just have really the, the one city of, of 6 million. So there are some similarities, some differences as well. Um, I want to keep my uh, comments short. I want to hear from the experts, but I'm really looking forward to hearing and learning from uh, the presenters tonight. Um, and as I settle into my role here as ambassador, I'm committed to building on this very healthy and positive relationship that we've uh, developed with the Kamada and um, you know, so that we can continue to exchange experiences and perspectives so that, um, that we can look at ways to improve our cities and as a consequence, uh, the lives of uh, the people that live in them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Todd Mercer, Embajador de Australia en Chile. Ahora sí vamos a comenzar con las ponencias de nuestros panelistas en este seminario online ¿Cómo cambia la ciudad frente a la crisis? Y vamos a presentar al primer orador que está en Australia, que es Michael Rose, y la presentación ya la vamos a hacer en inglés. Y de aquí en adelante comenzamos las presentaciones y después las preguntas y respuestas en inglés. Pero como les digo, ustedes tienen la opción de poder eh, tener traducción simultánea. Since 2015, Michael Rose has been the chairman of the Committee for Sydney, an independent think tank that provides research, thought, leadership, and advocacy on a range of economic, social, cultural, and environmental issues relevant to Sydney's liability and global competitiveness. In 2018, uh, he was a keynote speaker at the Chilean Chamber of Construction's annual conference in Santiago and Valparaíso. Michael has also been involved with Sydney's cultural and heritage organizations, including nine, year as, nine years sorry, as a chair of Sydney Living Museums and currently as a member of the Harbour Trust, a federal government body responsible for the rehabilitation and reuse of former defense land around Sydney Harbour. In these roles, Michael Rose has had frequent dealings with planning ministers, government agencies, and community groups in relation to the renewal and adaptive use of heritage assets and precincts across Sydney. Mr. Michael Rose, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Rodrigo, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the Chamber for the invitation to speak today. Uh, as Rodrigo said, I was in Santiago a couple of years ago to speak at the conference and I was hoping uh, to come back this year. Um, unfortunately, that's not to be, but I will look forward to an opportunity in the future to travel uh, back to Chile. Uh, we've been asked to speak this evening about the way in which COVID-19 will change cities and to share some of the community thinking about 
those kinds of changes, um, but also some of the thinking and work that the committee is doing um, in relation to the transition to recovery. Our view is that um, recovery will be uh, a slow process and will involve, you know, steps forward and steps backwards. And we've been looking to work with our government to plan that transition with um, the city in mind. Uh, I've also been asked to say a few things about um, the way in which the committee works with governments, the kind of civic collaboration that we have, uh, and to uh, provide some examples of the kinds of things we do as a as a non-profit organisation to help shape the debate uh, in Sydney. Could we have the next slide, please? So I'll talk a little bit about the committee and then I will ask Gabriel to speak around uh, the path to recovery and his thoughts on the implications for the city. And then I might come back and say a few more words about the way in which uh, we think COVID-19 might change the kinds of civic collaboration works on. Uh, the next slide, please. So the committee, as the ambassador said, and as Rodrigo said, um, so can I interrupt? Uh, Rodrigo, would you mind if you went on mute? I'm getting a lot of feedback out of your, thank you, that's much better. Um, uh, so the committee, the committee is an urban development tank. Our focus is on making the best city it can be uh, for the people who live here. Our focus is the whole of the city. Um, geographically, Sydney takes up a similar space to Chicago. Um, we are not political. Uh, we are business-led um, in the sense that um, some of our larger members are business organisations, but we are not a business lobby group. Uh, we, our view is that we advocate for the whole of the city and all of the citizens of the city. And our objective is, is not to make the city great for business, it's to make the city great for the people who live in Sydney. And uh, that means we want the city to be vibrant, prosperous, uh, healthy, which is particularly important now, uh, competitive, but also equitable and sustainable. So they're, they're our objective. Uh, next slide, please. Just a point about our membership. As I said, we're a business-led organization, but we're not a business organization. Our members come from just about every sector of activity in Sydney and all geographic areas of Sydney. So if you look, for example, uh, banking and finance, property and construction, uh, infrastructure, these are uh, areas where we have a lot of members and they are obviously economically very significant um, areas in Sydney's life. But you'll also see that we have uh, a lot of members from the education sector, in particular, all of the universities in the Sydney region. Uh, we have local government, we have state government agencies, we have federal government agencies, uh, and we have um, what I would call civil society organisations like the affordable housing sector, uh, and the arts and culture sector. And what that means is that when we go to talk to government, we can talk on behalf of all of economic life in Sydney and all of social and cultural life in Sydney, as opposed to simply being a business lobby group that is advocating for a particular sector. Next slide, please. These are the things that we uh, focus on uh, in our advocacy work and in our research. Um, over the last five years, it's been an extraordinary time in planning for Sydney, um, a major piece of um, planning work done to, you know, in effect, completely reimagine what the city will look like um, in the next 50 years. Uh, and that's been accompanied by an integrated transport plan, which is effectively 
looking to rewire the city. And um, that transport plan, that new land use plan supported by about um, uh, billions of dollars worth of new infrastructure investment in metro systems, rail systems, uh, road systems. Uh, so Sydney is in the process of growing rapidly and uh, in effect rebuilding itself around a new set of plans. Um, the second thing we focus on is the economy of Sydney. That's particularly important right now after the uh, Sydney economy has been badly damaged, not just by COVID-19, but also by a terrible bushfire season that we had over our summer, the worst that any of us can remember, which had a very dramatic impact on our tourism. Uh, and so um, we were already thinking around Sydney's place in economic recovery before COVID-19 came, and uh, it's even more important now. Uh, we also focus on governance. Um, resilience uh, has been a, a critical issue. And again, the fires over the summer um, brought to the front of everyone's thinking the long-term climate and resilience uh, positioning of Sydney. And that's been an important part of our work. Uh, and then mobility and culture. Uh, and in these, in these areas, focusing on mobility and fo focusing on Sydney's cultural life, one of our big focuses has been uh, to ensure that we're building an equitable city as the city expands and that um, access and mobility is equitably distributed and that the beautiful assets of our city are available to everyone. Uh, next slide, please. The way the committee works uh, really is that we drive the civic conversation in Sydney. Uh, we do that by bringing together our members. So our convening power is strong. Uh, we are often asked by uh, government if we can bring people together to have the conversation that needs to be had. Um, and because our membership is so broad, um, we have the ability to uh, bring together uh, large groups who have an interest in a particular topic in order to frame up the discussion and then uh, ensure that the discussion is had across the city. And we support that, that ongoing conversation about the city through our research and through our advocacy activities. Um, and effectively what we, are, what we are doing is we are identifying important issues for the city we do research on those issues to um, get the evidence that is helpful in this for making decisions. We communicate about that research. We advocate to government for the policy changes, which are in, we think are necessary, and where we can provide assistance, either as the committee or through our members, um, we um, help government. We help them by framing up new policies by commenting on legislation um, by participating in working groups that are getting things done. And this, this is particularly important now um, at a time of COVID when it's very hard to get people together physically. Um, the committee is doing a lot of work to bring people together online to discuss the important issues of recovery for the city and to uh, help decision makers think about what the long term uh, implications uh, of COVID-19 are for the city. Uh, next slide, please. A lot of our research um, turns up in our publications. These are all available if you'd like to look at them on the committee's website. Um, so publications around the city's economic performance, um, the revitalization of our neighbourhoods, for example, our 24-hour economy. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, and some further publications just from the last year, um, looking at things like um, uh, how to create an effective um, multi-centred city and, and also the connections between Sydney and other regional cities through high-speed rail uh, and um, Sydney's global connections and again for a, a city that is built on international trade and investment um, 
clear thinking about Sydney's role as a global hub is going to be critical as we come out of COVID-19. So that's a bit of background around the, the things that the committee in Sydney focuses on and, and how we tend to think about the issues for the city and we're bringing that same thinking to COVID-19. And I'll just throw to Gabriel now who can talk a, a little bit about our thinking on recovery and um, what's next for cities generally. Thank you, Michael, very much. Buenos dias a todos ustedes. Espero que pudiera dar esta charla en español, pero hace demasiado tiempo y se me, se me olvidó uh, las palabras. Um, yo soy americano. Um, he vivido en Sydney hace un año y medio. Antes uh, yo trabajaba uh, en, en una posición parecida en la ciudad de San Francisco. Perspectiva de, de un extranjero aquí en Australia, pero, pero uh, estoy aprendiendo mucho. Ok, so with that, I switch to English. Sorry, I can't do more. Uh, next slide, please. Um, well, Australians are feeling very proud of themselves, and I would say rightly so. Um, through a combination of luck, uh, of being an island that is far away, perhaps, but more than luck, um, a pragmatism that uh, is is a defining feature of Australian politics. The government listened to the scientists and uh, shut the country down and shut the economy down uh, early enough to stop the infection. Um, uh, I got a text. Is everything okay, Rodrigo? All good? Can't hear you. You're on mute. Um, all right, I'm going to keep going and assume everything's all right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other thing that I think is um, helping us right now is that the size of the fiscal stimulus has been um, has been big enough to matter. Um, it's uh, as a percent of GDP, almost ten percent, one of the biggest in the world. We we don't think it's perfect. We would have done something differently, but it's been it's been effective at um, preventing the bottom from dropping out of the economy. Next slide. In spite of this, it will be the biggest recession for Australia since the 1930s. I think this is going to be true of every country in the world, except except maybe some of the some of the um, fastest growing Asian economies. But for almost the rest of the world, um, we uh, we're faced with something now, perhaps analogous with the 1930s. Um, I know I find that both. Um, very terrifying and very hopeful. The changes that came out of the 1930s in the United States were um, quite helpful for building the future of that country, but uh, other countries, not so much. And I think that uh, 
parable, that analogy of the 1930s is something we are holding in our minds that from this moment in history, there will be a, a range of possibilities from very bad to very good. And it's up to us to decide what we make of this, of this historical disjuncture. Next slide. Um, I've now got a series of slides with a lot of text. I will not read them all, but I thought I'd put them in here just for you to glance at, and you can have this slide so when we're done. Um, these five um, columns um, are the same five columns Michael showed you earlier. They are the committee's business process, the five ways we work, convening, research, communication, advocacy, and technical assistance. The purpose of this slide is to show you that we are still doing what we do. We are still doing our core business, just applied to questions of transition and recovery from COVID. We realized early on that we were not the public health experts, um, and we would have to do our best to take the advice of them, just like everyone else. But on the topic of recovery, we would have a lot to offer. Next slide. We have organized our thinking into five phases. Um, and this is our this is our proposal on how to think about recovery. Um, denial is a universal phase in every country. During the denial phase, the public health people understood what was going on, but the rest of us did not. And the key question during the denial phase was how many days did it take for the public health people to convince government to act? Um, none of us could believe it at first, but eventually everyone did. Um, lockdown, um, I hear now the IMF is calling this the great lockdown um, is the phase um, in of quarantine, of shutting everything down. Australia's lockdown was not as stringent as some countries. Um, traffic was down 50 to 65 percent in Sydney, but in some countries it was down 95 to 98 percent. So the um, the lockdown here was a bit more relaxed, but it seems to have done the trick anyway. Um, transition is the phase we are now in, in Australia. When the economy starts to reopen, it is a very awkward phase, however, because the transition is defined by the virus still being present. So the economy is half open, half closed. No international travel, no large gatherings. Um, the question we do not know is how long the transition phase lasts. It may last for years. It does not end until there is a vaccine or a treatment or population immunity, herd immunity, which means we can go about our business and it will be safe to gather and safe to travel. The greatest uncertainty now is when does that happen? Um, we are dependent on either uh, being rescued by science, coming up with a vaccine or a cure, or uh, eventually um, letting this virus run its course. Um, finally, after the uh, transition, we enter recovery, and that is what I'll, I'll try to focus on now um, where we can really power the economy back. Um, the new normal is what we arrive at. We may only understand the new normal in hindsight. When, we, when it becomes clear what was changed um, as a result of this crisis. Next slide. We have um, defined for each phase, what are the essential tasks 
of public health, of economic management, and of urban policy. Um, I, uh, focusing on the transition for a minute, um, the public health focus is managing the dance of uh, how much to reopen while managing the pandemic. The economic focus is on restarting as much of the economy as possible while um, trying to somehow make up for the fact that much of the economy is still closed. And in urban policy, we focus on how to retrofit, how to retrofit urban spaces and urban flows um, to impose physical distances. Um, next slide. Some of the committee's um, key uh, advocacy priorities you can see here, um, major investments in infrastructure, economic reform, fixing the tax structure, a better process for working through bankruptcies quickly, um, a new system for retraining to help people get out of their previous roles into new careers. Um, and for Australia, a, a new global talent attraction strategy. Again, we can talk about any of these in the q and I just wanted to give you a chance to glance at these. These are some of the things we're working on. Next slide. Um, we have um, federal policy priorities. Um, right now, and then we have state as well, which is the next slide, but the federal ones are number one, launch um, a global talent attraction and business recruitment campaign. Um, building on Australia's success in managing COVID, um, essentially, um, we believe there's a moment when Australia um, has been able to demonstrate that it has lower sovereign risk than other places because uh, it has healthcare, because it is a pragmatic place. Um, number two, um, perhaps quite controversially, we believe Australia needs to lower its business tax, its headline business tax rate to match other social democracies um, uh, and make that up with a, with a, a, a different tax. To, to maintain high fiscal capacity. And then finally, um, we want Australia to increase uh, research and development spending to uh, just above the OECD average. And we're proposing 3%. Australia is today quite low on r and spending. Next slide. We have a longer list of advocacy priorities for the state. Um, as you may know, in the Australian system of government, the states have a lot of the power. Um, compared to the United States, um, Australian state governments have, a, have much more power. Both the federal government and city government are weaker in Australia. So we do a lot of our work focused on the state of New South Wales. And I won't go through this. I just wanted to show you some of the some of the list. Um, uh, next slide. There are also um, a lot of uh, a lot of what needs to be done will not be done by government. It will be done by industry and by civil society. These are some of the major. Uh, things that industry is leading on. Um, and maybe most important is enacting codes of practice for how to operate during COVID. Um, I wanna, I guess, sum up the economic part of this and then turn to the city part for a minute. Um, during lockdown, the focus was on essentially welfare payments, getting money to households and businesses to survive. In the next phase, the focus shifts to fiscal stimulus, so government spending to do things that are socially important. Hopefully, they're, they're things. Hopefully, they're projects that make sense. Um, 
But after that, we enter the third phase, which is actually restarting the real economy. And that is where our focus shifts now. What can be done to actually um, um, get, get the normal, true, real economy back and running? Um, next slide. As we try to think about the new normal, this is really speculation right now. Um, how will the economy change? Which new industries will emerge? Which ones will never reemerge? How will cities change? Um, will people come back to public transport? And if so, how long will that take? Um, will people flee cities and move to lower density locations? Will central business district office space have permanently lower demand, in which case CBDs will become more residential? Um, Will the governing institutions need to change? Um, clearly, in America, the answer is yes. In Australia, the answer might be no. But there have been some innovations in Australia, uh, new forms of state cooperation that people would like to keep going. Does Australia want to change anything about its public health system? The answer is probably yes. Um, will the geopolitical relationship um, change Australia's role in the world? Um, almost certainly the answer is yes. But what does a world with less international travel mean for Australia, which is so far away? Next slide. The question, uh, do cities need to change, is so complicated for us essentially because we don't yet know what is temporary and what is permanent. If we believe that within a year or two or even three, there will be a virus or there will be a vaccine or there will be a treatment and it will once again be safe to gather crowds of people, to travel on airplanes, then um, cities may not need to change. But there may be things that we want to change. So this isn't just about predicting what will happen. This is about exercising some agency. Um, this, there may be things we don't want to build back differently. So we try to sort out temporary versus permanent. Next slide. Um, we've been organizing this into four quadrants, um, which you can see here. Um, we have a lot of focus right now in the top two. Basically, changes we want to make and COVID is an excuse to make them. So a classic example of that is um, putting in a, a temporary bicycle lane, something that we should have done anyway. Hopefully we can do it faster, we can accelerate it, hopefully it can become permanent. Um, an example of painful but necessary is um, reducing loading factors on the train. Not good. We don't want to do it, but we have to. Avoid as long as possible would be um, if you own an office building in the Sydney CBD, um, if you would be converting that to a residential use because you don't believe the demand is going to come back. Next slide. And you can see here some examples of how we populate this framework. We have dozens more. Next slide. I'll turn it back to you, Michael. Thanks. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, just to just to wrap up, I think what what Gabriel has shown, I think, is how we are thinking about the way cities might change. And that is because we don't know. And how, the extent to which they will change will depend on how long the COVID crisis lasts. Uh, and as Gabriel just showed, which, which changes we think are temporary, uh, which temporary changes we want to make permanent. Um, but just in the, uh, just quickly to wrap up, I wanted to perhaps pose some questions which the chamber might like to think about in terms of its engagement with
government in Chile and certainly things we're thinking about in terms of the changed nature of the civic debate because of COVID. Um, not, we have to think not only how the city's fabric will change, but also how the behaviour of people and institutions will change. So some questions we're asking ourselves, um, will there be rising inequality as a result of COVID-19? Now, it, it's had impacts on education, on health, on employment, uh, and we saw after the global financial crisis, we saw rising inequality. Uh, and so um, we're expecting it. And obviously in Chile, you've seen the consequences of that in the last 12 months also. So we're expecting that. Um, and how do we respond to that? Um, what will be the role of government in a new post-COVID economy? We're expecting that government will have a much bigger role and, and what will be the implications of that? Um, will we have more stable government or like the GFC, will we see greater instability after um, uh, COVID-19? Uh, will we see a government that's more prepared to experiment? We think that we will, certainly at the moment, we're seeing a government that's more prepared to experiment. Uh, what will be the relationship between government and business at the moment, the relationship is very good because government needs business and business needs government. But after the GFC, we saw the relationship between government and business become much more complicated um, as, as the sort of hard work of recovery was being taken on. Um, we're, we're expecting we're going to see a greater local focus in people's behavior, greater use of neighborhoods rather than downtown. Um, a greater use of Australia rather than people traveling in the way that they used to. And what, what are the implications of that for our city? What are the trade-offs that will be made between economic recovery and social and cultural recovery? Um, uh, for example, our government in New South Wales has announced a very strong focus on infrastructure projects as the way to get the economy started. But there also needs to be a um, focus on rebuilding society, re rebuilding neighbourhoods, um, re-establishing cultural institutions which have been hit hard. So what's that balance going to be is an important question. And the other thing is, to what extent will COVID um, take the focus off other critical issues? And as I mentioned before, a critical issue for Sydney is climate change, heat, fire, seawater rise. These are all issues which need to be talked about energy transition is an issue Sydney needs to talk about mobility. So how do we make sure that we, as we come out of COVID, we keep attention on other critical issues? So they're just some, some questions which we might uh, want to come back to and, and certainly how we're thinking about behavioural change as well as city change. Thanks, Rodrigo. Okay, now my mic is okay. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and thank you, Gabriel. I didn't have the chance to introduce uh, Gabriel Metcalf. He's the CEO uh, of the Committee for Sydney, uh, a role he has held since January 2019. From 2005 to 2018, Gabriel uh, served as the president and CEO of SPUR, SPUR, an urban policy research and advocacy group for the San Francisco Bay Area. Gabriel has led initiatives on housing, transport, economic development, and climate adaptation, among other topics, uh, striving to bring together both vision and practicality. Now it's um, the turn of Paz Serra. Paz is the OC Urban Development Division as part of the Housing and Urban Planning Ministry of Chile, MIN. 
She's an architect from the Chile University. She's a master in urban design from Oxford Polytechnic. She's the ex-dean of the architecture and construction faculty from the Autonoma University. She's also the ex-head of uh, the housing and urban planning ministry in the Araucanía region. And she now is also the coordinator of the National Urban Parks Policy. Paz Serra, it's your turn, please, and welcome. Muy buenas tardes, muchas gracias, Rodrigo. Eh, me sumo a este webinar con mucho entusiasmo. Eh, entendí que es un seminario en inglés, eh, puesto que más de la mitad de los participantes son de habla inglesa. Y, por supuesto, estoy disponible para hablar en castellano cuando el consultante que haga la pregunta al final de la presentación hable castellano. Así que voy a hacer el esfuerzo de hablar en inglés. So, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to have this conversation with Michael Rose, President of Committee for Sydney, Gabriel Metcalf, CEO of Committee for Sydney, Eduardo Minder, Presidente de la Comisión Ciudad y Territorio de la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción, and with everyone that is taking part of this webinar, you, Rodrigo Gendelman, first of all. Uh -huh. Also very grateful to Australian Embassy, Austrian, Cámara Chileno Australiana de Comercio, and of course, to our Cámara Chilena de la Construcción. First of all, next slide, please. We have to ask ourselves, is time to get conclusion? Isn't it too soon to get proper learning? We're still in the middle of the pandemia, just into a health crisis. We have to zoom out from facts. We have to get some distance in order to have a more serious capacity to analyze what really happened in the urban areas. Anyway, by now, we have seen many architects or planners or other professionals related to urban development doing certain reflections that we can attend. So some reflections could be made. Second, next slide. Do we have to rethink about urban densification? During decades, we have been doing such an effort to get closer the city centers to the suburbs. Since the Industrial Revolution, we experimented disorganized urban growth, sometimes a real chaos. Cities grew so quickly that many of them weren't prepared to have urban policies and urban planning to structure their development opportunately. I mean, at the same time, that it was occurring. Particularly, the second and third world suffered lack of coordination between the reality and the urban policy. So many of our South American cities became huge urban metropolitan areas. Afterwards, we have to recondition them. So since the last 30 years, we have been working hard to recondition them reinforce equality in the access to goods and services. In other words, restriction the extensive growth and promote the concentration around the downtowns, increasing density in the better locations, closer to employment, services and public goods sometimes. Some, it's something that we confirm one and another is is that people it's going to be where the job is employment is the key urban densification was not ever thought based on the spread out of a virus this is absolutely new and drastically different from the urban knowledge that we have we have consolidated during the history of our city shall we have to rethink the future of metropolitan areas then third Next slide. How to move through cities? Do we have to rethink public transportation? Public transportation is a massive system by a sense. 
it was planned to move large number of people precisely to make closer the employment and services to the citizens at further areas. It was not designed for social distancing. It wasn't designed to avoid virus infection. Again, this is totally a new urban issue to consider. Although many urban regulations, particularly at the 19th century, were developed because of health requirements like sewerage or providing drinking water, etc. All of them were mainly hygienic decisions, not viral spread decisions. So again, COVID-19 is totally new in urban planning. Coming back to public transportation, the quick conclusion by now is to promote individual ways of transportation, which is offered, social distancing. And also, we need more open views and better ventilated ways of transport, because the stress of massive public transportation is an issue itself to improve. We need to massify other modes of transport, basically cycles, all type of them, bicycles, scooters, motorcycles, and pedestrianization. Probably other things like monorail, cable way in capsules. Therefore, the goal is tending definitely to bikeable cities and ideally walkable cities or walkable neighborhoods. What is a huge challenge because most of our cities already exist. So we have to renew, recycle, cycle again. Fourth, next slide. Do we have to rethink land planning? Looking back into the history of urban development, we observed how cities' distribution over the land during centuries was much balanced than now, in terms that there were more cities and towns of moderated size. Instead of these times that big cities became much bigger than before, while small cities became smaller, almost risking disappear, probably with mainly old population. That old structure, which combined urban and rural areas, I mean, many different towns in the middle of the countryside without the risk of growing into a large urban extension, that is to say, no metropolitan areas, that harmony between urban and rural spaces created a sort of green buffer or open space in between cities. Nobody thought by then that that organization would be in the future an appropriate answer to cut any disease spread. All small cities allow the existence of countryside firewalls like process. Today we confront continuous urban areas with many kilometers extension. I'm sure it sounds strange if we compare animal production strategies with pandemia learning in the urban issues. But if we observed how the chicken colonies distribute their production barns, we realize that the key method is about separating groups of productive areas mainly to avoid virus spread and reduce death indicators. So we can conclude that older rural-urban relationship is similar to chicken production sanitary strategy. In conclusion, one of the most important learning until now, to me, is reorganize the territorial distribution of population. And that means basically distribute the employment in a more intelligent way. That's to say economic incentives to relocate industry or productive activity in order to bring people to middle-sized cities or towns. We have to reduce metropolitan areas using the already existing network or town structure 
over the territory. And within the existing metropolitan cities, we should intend to break the continuity of the edification, looking for open spaces, parks or great avenues as district edges. This trend to atomization or search of healthy isolation is the real new issue that we can collect from this pandemia. How we can do it, we still don't know. That's the challenge, that's the invitation. Thank you very much indeed. Muchísimas gracias, uh, Pacerra. Thank you very much, Pas, for that uh, words. Now I'm going to introduce you to Eduardo Minder. He's the chairman of the City and Territory Commission of the Chilean Chamber of Construction. He's a real estate developer and builder. He's an MBA from the Business Institute in Madrid and also Master in Engineering Sciences and Civil Engineer from the Catholic University of Chile. Eduardo Minder, it's your turn, please. Muchas gracias, Rodrigo. Muy buenas noches a todos. Eh, no sé si con el mismo éxito que Paz, pero voy a intentar también hacer esto en inglés. Eh, si cometo algunos errores, desde ya pido disculpas. Aprovecho de dar las gracias también eh, a la Embajada, a la AUSCHAM y a nuestra Cámara por organizar este seminario y permitirme compartir eh, con Michael, con Gabriel y con Paz eh, para discutir estos temas tan importantes que nos convocan. Well, uh, I'm afraid uh, we have much more questions than answers at this point. Uh, and looking at the rest uh, of the other presentations, uh, I think we, we are facing the same problem, uh, more questions than answers. Uh, the, the challenge here is how we build better and safer cities in this pandemic context. Please, the next slide. Uh, and also, uh, we, we have to understand this challenge as an opportunity to rethink the way we are doing and building our cities. Next one, please. Of course, we, this, this is going to be a tough task since uh, we are going to be subject to improving or at least not worsening the access to affordable housing, which is, has been a very hard problem here in Chile, and also uh, developing strategies in order to face uh, and fight a economic crisis or recession, and of course, the big problem of unemployment. Next slide, please. Probably a likely answer uh, can be borrowed from the Consejo Nacional de Desarrollo Urbano, uh, that is uh, the, our National Urban Development Board, which uh, we have uh, been active, uh, we have been have been uh, an active participation in in that uh, board, and um, we have been developing three axes to to try to achieve uh, a healthy city. Uh, uh, urban proximity, or what is being called a 15 to 30 minute walkable city, uh, sustainable urban mobility, and also, also a healthy environment. Next one, please. The, some ideas that can help us uh, I try to put them together here in this, in this slide, is uh, we have to work very hard and develop a, a close uh, public, private people, non-governmental organizations partnership. I think here we have a lot to learn uh, from Australia. Uh, they have several experience working on that. I think the, the underlying concept that we're missing here in Chile and we have to work as a society uh, is rebuild trust. Uh, 
uh, trust is something that uh, Australians have, have much to, to teach us. Also, we have to take in, into account the impact of technology and digitalization uh, that allows us, uh, allow people to work in a different way, uh, to meet their personal needs in a different way too, but also we have to guarantee uh, internet access as, as a, another utility access. A third thing that we have to, to work is uh, since we're going to have a public investment, we, we, we have to try to conduct that in order to bring city to the citizens, which is uh, places that have not a uh, great development should be over uh, invested. Also, we have to work very hard, uh, and Gabriel mentioned that too, uh, in order to stimulate the economy to get a, a very fast recovery or the fastest we can. And also other ideas that can help us are new bike, new bike lanes, workable cities, public space, electromobility, among others. Finally, uh, please the next slide. I would like to, to extend an invitation. Uh, we have to, to turn this, this very hard moment into a, a opportunity, a, a chance to turn the cities as I'm, I'm very, as you can see, I'm very fan of the spaghetti westerns. Let's, let's turn the cities into the good, not the bad or neither the ugly. So that's uh, the invitation I want to make as a final comment. Thank you, Rodrigo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Esa era la presentación. That was the presentation of one of our four guests today. Eduardo Minder is the chairman of the City and Territory Commission of the Chilean Chamber of Construction, La Cámara Chilena de la Construcción. Es tiempo para preguntas del público. It's time for questions for you. Uh, I think Gabriel had to leave because he had another uh, important thing to do, but we still have uh, uh, Michael and Eduardo. So let's start uh, with the questions from This from abroad, and we have a lot of people from Chile watching this um, live webinar. So it's very interesting to have the chance to express their thoughts and their questions. The first question that we have from our public is the following, and I think it's perfect both for uh, our guests from Australia and for our guests from Chile. Although government will have a bigger role in the post-COVID recovery, it probably won't have the strength and funding availability to rebuild society, as Michael said. Which is the role of the public-private people partnerships in this process? And I think, Michael, this organization that you lead is a very good example of how you can do things mixing the public and the private sectors. Um Look, it is a great question because uh, government will want to play a bigger role. And as you say, uh, there will be less funding available. So government will need to choose priorities and they'll need help choosing those priorities. So one, one important component of the public-private partnership is for, for um, the private sector to do a lot of the thinking around priorities and to be able to speak openly with government about the things it should prioritize. And they won't always be obvious. You know, it may be more important to prioritize mental health over roads or um, local neighborhoods over uh, important infrastructure projects. So there's that prioritization point. And the second thing businesses can do, and this goes back to Eduardo's point about um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, the private sector um, will continue to maintain a global point of view and will be able to uh, uh, 
recognize and promote best practice in responses. And it can do that both in its own work and in the work that it encourages government to undertake. So I think there's an important role of influence. Uh, there's an important role of developing and disseminating best practice. Thank you, Michael. Maybe Pass uh, or Eduardo, maybe you want to share with us what you think about this question, about how, how can we uh, manage to, to have the public and the, the private sectors together uh, to help our country after this uh, COVID-19. I, I, I would like uh, to take the word. Maybe Pass, you want to say something or? Up to you, Eduardo. <laughs> No, please go ahead. <laughs> no, actually, I, I didn't. Okay, uh, I ha I think the 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 Consejo Nacional de Desarrollo Urbano has a great role here. Our national board, uh, it's, it's not exactly the same uh, as they have in, in Sydney. This is national wide, but it's starting uh, at this moment. There are three uh, regional uh, boards. Uh, has a, a lot to do. It's a place where we start building trust, uh, where, where we can start discussing, uh, where, where we can meet uh, with uh, not a typical uh, uh, counterparts. So I think there, uh, there is a place uh, where we can start building things. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have very much faith on that. So I would like to say that, Rodrigo. Rodrigo? Yeah, yeah, please, pass. Well, public sector to me is the one who puts regulations. And public and private sector is the one who actually make, make the same. I mean, it's the executive uh, role. So it's impossible not to be in a, in a partnership that it has to work. It's no about and we put we can do certain things, but every time it would be fewer. So um, the ways to make relationships, there are too many corporations, uh, the council that Eduardo mentioned, Consejo Nacional de Desarrollo Urbano, any project itself, it has a public statement and a private one. Thank you very much, uh, Pass. We have a lot of questions, trying to organize all these questions. And maybe we can go with the next one that says this, the following. If the goals tend to walkable or cyclable or individual ways of transport, where or how do we put the elderly or the weaker uh, in terms of base uh, health conditions on public transport, Will the new normal put them in first place or will be the most affected in terms of uh, mobility? Maybe Michael can give uh, us your point of view from Australia and maybe you can tell us a little bit about this 40 years by plan that Gabriel was saying that he wanted to be, he was thinking that maybe it can be done in three years. So maybe we can mix those two questions, Michael. Uh, sure. Uh, well. Uh, firstly, I think the starting point for this answer is a is a, a point that Eduardo made about the 15 minute city. So in Sydney, we have been talking for a long time about the 30 minute city and uh, in planning circles now, people are really starting to talk about the 15 minute city, the idea that it's your local neighborhood, which will be the primary place that you go for most of the, your interactions. Um, and that that immediately changes mobility and probably changes mobility in good ways for elderly people. Um, the second thing you asked about the prioritization of elderly people on public transport, we're actually seeing this issue right now in Sydney. So um, uh, the uh, lockdown came to an end last Friday. Uh, the government put in place new arrangements for social distancing on public transport. And that required reduced numbers on buses and trains. 
And the transport union immediately said to the government, well, what do you want us to do if there are school children or old people left at the bus stop? And so there was an immediate compromise that you can't leave children standing around while all the buses go past and you can't leave old people um, sitting in the rain. Um, and so immediately the, the, the regulation was modified to uh, take into account the needs of more vulnerable people. And this is, I suppose, to, to the point we're making earlier, we still don't know how everything's going to work. There will need to be a lot of experimentation to see what will happen. And, uh, uh, and as different areas of quality are identified, then new strategies will have to be developed to assist those, those vulnerable people. Uh, and to your last question about cycleways, um, uh, Sydney is not a good cycling city. Um, there's always been a dominance of cars and that's been changing very slowly compared to other cities. With the lockdown, uh, there was a, a very significant increase in the number of people cycling. And as you probably know from uh, Santiago, the more people who are on bikes, the safer bike bike riding becomes. Um, you know, the, the, the more visible riders are, um, the safer it is for them. And so there's been an increase in cycling and we don't think that that increase will necessarily go away. And so government needs to respond to it or local government needs to respond to it. And, and um, one of the things that we are encouraging government to think about is um, not only the needs of cyclists, but the needs of pedestrians. So because we're not a big cycling city, there isn't this hierarchy that you see, say, in, um, in Amsterdam between pedestrians, cyclists and traffic. And so there's a there's a there's an awareness issue that has to be created here too around who uses the street and who has priority in the way that they use the street. And that's an education issue as much as it is an infrastructure issue. Michael, let me let me make you another question because uh, you're speaking because you're the you're the, the, the head of the committee for Sydney, but maybe Chile is not that easy to understand. What exactly is the committee for Sydney and how it relates uh, with the government? So is there a formal link with the government? You just make suggestions. Can you tell us a little bit? Uh, what is this committee for Sydney and why it has been so important in the last 20 years to make Sydney the city it is today? So um, we, we're, we're not a part of government. We are um, a private membership organization. We're a not-for-profit organization. And as I said in my presentation, we represent um, all of the sectors that are active in Sydney. So we speak on behalf of the city, not on behalf of any particular sector. And um, our credibility, I suppose, and our trust that people give us comes from the quality of our work from our research and our advocacy work. Um, government trust us to, to bring forward good ideas. Our members trust us to represent those ideas well to government. And, the, and I think what we're talking about when we talk to government is how to make the city better for its citizens. So we're not trying to promote a particular economic outcome. We're saying what we want is a city that is equitable and fair, a city which is prosperous, um, a city which is competitive, a city which is beautiful, a city which is sustainable. And um, by talking about these ideas and by having evidence and strong policy suggestions, we influence the public debate and ultimately we influence the regulatory environment and then our members get on and do what they do in that environment. Absolutely interesting, and it seems so necessary. Here in Chile, for the last year and a half, almost two years, we have something that is trying to develop as uh, the Committee for Sydney that is called Corporación Ciudades. So I want to ask Paz and, of course, Eduardo, how important do you think uh, 
is for us, for Chileans, to have uh, something like this committee for Sydney in our country, where we have a lot of problems, like, for example, elections for just four years, and then the president has to leave, and we don't have metropolitan authorities. So how, can, how, how important can it be to have this kind of institutions um, to help think and build our cities and our country in the long term? Pass, if you want to answer, please. If you want. Okay. Eh, voy a responder en castellano, Rodrigo. Ya, ¿Ese es suficiente esfuerzo, digo? Eh, bueno, todas las corporaciones de desarrollo en toda la literatura y en toda la experiencia internacional han sido muy importantes como un articulador entre el sector público y el sector privado, especialmente por la naturaleza de cada uno, por la gran diferencia que existe, ¿cierto?, entre la naturaleza del público y del privado. Nosotros tuvimos hace años la Corporación de Desarrollo por Santiago, eh, que lideró muy buena iniciativa en su momento, y hoy día la Corporación Ciudad, que tú la acabas de nombrar a mí, me parece una muy buena iniciativa, no obstante no tiene la capacidad de ejecución que le atribuía la propia ley a las corporaciones antiguas. Eh, que es el caso de las corporaciones australianas, y nosotros cuando fuimos a, en este viaje, esta misión tecnológica que tuvimos a Australia, Sydney, Quizá de los principales aprendizajes que trajimos fue la capacidad de acción que tienen estas corporaciones justamente porque establecen en determinados territorios su propia eh, una regulación particular para ese territorio acordada previamente entre el sector público y privado. Muchas de estas corporaciones se ciñen en un determinado lugar, en este caso a un sector de Sydney. Entonces yo lo veo con muy buenos ojos cuando eh, la distancia entre el sector público, toda la permisología, toda la normativa, distancia mucho el accionar de, del privado. Y un, un ejemplo de lo que recién hablaba eh, Michael respecto de las bicicletas, de la ciclovía. Nosotros necesitamos con urgencia tener un plan integrado de de ciclos, que significa no solamente la bicicleta, sino los scooters y toda lo, la electromovilidad que hoy día está disponible. Pero, por ejemplo, ya en eso nosotros tenemos iniciativas públicas, privadas, y cuando digo públicas pueden ser estas municipales o pueden ser eh, sectoriales del Ministerio de Vivienda, en este caso, o pueden ser regionales de un FNDR, eh, y no conversan necesariamente entre ellas, por lo tanto, este rol articulador público-privado sería muy bueno. Lo que decía aquí Michael, que a mí lo tomo como un aprendizaje, ¿cierto? Dice su plan de 30 minutos, donde cualquiera debiese estar a no más de 30 minutos en un modelo de bicicleta o scooter, lo que significa extender redes hacia la periferia, pero también significa extender servicios a la periferia para llegar en 30 minutos y lo que él decía de reservar el transporte público ojalá exclusivamente para el adulto mayor, que es algo que a nosotros no se nos había ocurrido y que podemos eh, o sea, emular de la experiencia australiana. Entonces eh, tengo mucha fe en las corporaciones pero eso significa cambios legales en nuestro país para que esas corporaciones tengan capacidad de acción, si no va a ser una una figura poco efectiva, eso. Uh, gracias, Paz. Well, Michael, one of the, the, the things that Paz said that is that we need legal changes to make these corporations, uh, like the Committee for Sydney, uh, to be really strong here in Chile. So talking a little bit more about uh, the Committee for Sydney, that is something very interesting for us, for the Chileans. How was the committee created and how is funded? That is something that start thinking, no, where do they get the money from? Sure. So um, the committee was created just after the Olympic Games in Sydney. So um, all of a sudden, uh, Sydney felt, well, the whole world is looking at us. How do we take all this attention and all this affection and uh, make sure our city remains a great global city? And uh, so that's, that, that's the history. So in 2000, it was created. Um, we are a member organization. So we're funded by our members. 
uh, we have uh, about 150 members and they pay a membership fee every year and that membership fee pays our budget, which is not a big budget. Um, and we also um, ask the members to help us with some of our research. Um, members provide us with office accommodation and they provide us with locations to hold our events, for example. So we have generous members who support the work that we do. But something that's really important um, in this idea is uh, you, you need three things for an organisation like the Committee for Sydney to be successful. First, you need to do good work. You have to have good research, good policy development, um, good advocacy implementation, good relationship with government. So the committee needs to be effective. If the committee is effective, then you have committed members. And if you have committed members and effective policy and research, then government listens. And you need all those three things to happen. You need good work, committed members, and the government is listening. If your members are not committed, the government won't listen. And if the government's not listening, then your members drift away. So all three things have to happen uh, in order for this to work. And uh, in our history, we're, we're in a very good place now because we're doing very good work. We have very strong engagement with government and very strong engagement with members. But there was a period 10 years ago where the government had no interest in ideas. It just, it was a lazy government that didn't want to do anything. And so an organization like the committee doesn't have a lot of work to do if government won't listen. So you, you need those, it's a very important idea. These three things must work together for um, this kind of organization to be successful. And about the situation we're living today, what sort of design solutions does the committee of uh, Sydney have in mind for social housing and residential aged care post this COVID-19 crisis? Yeah. Uh, well, I think on, resi on, on housing, uh, if you think back to the slide that Gabriel showed where there were things you think you need to do and COVID-19 gives you the opportunity to do them, housing is in that category for us. We're saying to the government, uh, you have had a housing issue. And in Sydney, our issues are slightly different. We have a need for social housing. Um, we have a need for affordable housing, um, particularly for um, essential workers like police and nurses and what have you. And we also have a housing affordability issue, which is it's just a very, very expensive place to live. So um, we've said to the government, there are, uh, ha there's a housing response, i.e. building more housing, but there are also tax and other responses that you need to take in order to stimulate um, housing construction and, and improve housing affordability. So on housing, we're saying you already had a problem. COVID-19 actually gives you the solution because you want to stimulate economic activity, make housing one of those economic activities. On nursing homes, we have a highly regulated uh, aged care sector already. Um, we have had um, a, a COVID-19 in, in just one. Um, there has been one facility where there have been, um, I think, you know, 10 deaths, which is 10% of all the deaths in Australia in this one facility. But um, apart from that, this, the sector is pretty highly regulated already um, and I think has come through this crisis pretty well. Thank you, Michael. I have another question for all of you. Um, Density and crowdedness were like a strong trend that almost nobody discussed for the last decade. According to Edward Glaser in his book, The Triumph of the City, densified cities are the healthiest, greenest, and richest 
in both cultural and economic terms, places to live. Can we still think that way? What is going to happen with this uh, trend of, of wanting to live in, in, dense, in density, uh, meeting with people, knowing uh, people, getting more cultural and, and fun chances in, in, in your life to, to live better? What do you think, uh, Pass uh, Eduardo, Michael, about um, this issue? Um, well, I, I take the, the word. Eduardo. Uh, I think it's, uh, as Pass said before, uh, it's too early to answer this, that question. Uh, for me, at least, uh, I, I think we're in the middle of the storm yet. So uh, it's not like saying densification has to be killed uh, or it's, it's, it's not that easy to answer those, that question. Uh, we, have, we will have sure we will sure have to work on having safer and cleaner cities, but I it's hard for me to imagine that cities will disappear or we will start living only in towns or, or, or villages. Sorry, sorry, Rodrigo, not to answer more deeply, but but it's we're in the middle of a storm. It's, it's very hard to answer. Um, Rodrigo, I think. Uh... I, I think I can try and answer. I don't think Please. density. I don't think density is the problem. If you look at the cities which have done very well, so uh, Taipei, Seoul, Singapore, um, these are very dense cities, uh, and density hasn't prevented them from managing the crisis well. So that's the first point. Um, the second point is. Um, I think people will want to, uh, there, there may be a trend for people to move um, uh, away from the crowds of the city. So that might mean not so much about density of housing, but um, as we've already discussed, density on transport, um, uh, density in shopping and markets and these sorts of things. So there might be some nervousness. But the other thing about density, if the world doesn't travel as much, if, if flying from, at the moment you can live in one city, but you can work in another um, and you just travel around a lot. If the world stops traveling, then the network benefits of cities will increase. It will become more important to be located in a city, more important to be near the people that, um, uh, whose industries align with your work and, and with your industry. So we could have a situation where people are trying to avoid crowds, but also confirming um, their desire to live and work in cities. So I, my guess is we will continue to see density, um, but we'll see changes in the way that people manage density. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Pass, if you want to add some words, because we'll, we're almost finishing, so um, maybe you want to comment something about this. Uh, I think Pass has some problems uh, with her mic, so I'm going to start um, finishing this very interesting conversation. Um, I want to say thank you to Pass, uh, pass is back. Okay. Sí, sí. Eh, no estamos despidiendo. Puedo comentar algo de la no. densidad. Por favor. Uh, te, te había yeah. justamente preguntado si querías comentar. So please talk sí. us a little bit about this density thing. Ya, yeah, muchas gracias. Quería comentar, pero tuve un problema técnico. Bueno, yo creo que la gran pregunta de base eh, para un urbanista es justamente esa. Hemos trabajado durante décadas para poder aumentar la densificación al interior de las ciudades, justamente para poder acercar los servicios y, como dije, sobre todo el empleo a los lugares residenciales. Y esa pregunta, obviamente, en un contexto donde... O sea, jamás pensamos las ciudades de una manera en que tuviéramos que evitar la propagación de un virus. Entonces, ahora, hacerse la pregunta de que la densidad 
urbana puede ser una causal de propagación, nos cuestiona eh, el sistema que hemos venido, o sea, nos cuestiona nuestro objetivo durante casi un siglo. Eh, entonces, la respuesta es difícil tenerla a tan poco tiempo, pero obviamente ahí hay un tema por desarrollar, tal como expliqué en mi presentación, creo que nosotros, si las ciudades ya existen, no van a poder desaparecer las áreas metropolitanas, pero tendremos que repensar cómo se intervienen para quebrar la edificación continua, por lo menos, y en eso me acuerdo de tu constante preocupación, Rodrigo, de los cerros Isla, eh, como a modo de ejemplo, porque también hay muchas otras variantes eh, de buffers verdes, ciertos como pueden ser los parques, grandes avenidas, y bueno, constantemente en la historia del urbanismo nosotros hemos tenido que tomar decisiones en materia de higiene o de salud. Eh, todo, o sea, el urbanismo nace esencialmente por un tema de salud en la revolución industri industrial, cuando tuvimos que aparecer con alcantarillas, con agua potable, etc. Y hoy día es un desafío mayor que la verdad, quien diga que tiene la respuesta sería demasiado eh, soberbio porque tenemos que construirla y nos vamos a demorar en eso. Entonces, eh, solamente tenemos algunos fenómenos en los cuales nos podemos apoyar, pero habrá que hacer, como dicen los australianos, un think tank para poder abordar un tema como ese. Muchas gracias, Paz Serra, la jefa de la DDU del MIMBU. Thank you very much, uh, Michael Rose, uh, from the Committee of Sydney. Very interesting, uh, very important for us to listen to you and to know what you're doing, like Gabriel Metcalf, what you're doing in Australia, what you're doing in Sydney, because it's a great model for us here in Chile, especially in Santiago. So thank you very much, uh, thank Michael. You. Thank you. Thank you very much for Gabriel Metcalf, CEO of the Committee of Sydney. Uh, muchas gracias, Eduardo Binder, Presidente de la Comisión Ciudad y Territorio de la Cámara de la Constitución. Muchas, uh, gracias. muchas gracias, Rodrigo, y también aprovecho a agradecer a Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. Y siempre muy bueno poder compartir con Paz, de, de quien he aprendido muchas cosas. Así que gracias a Paz siempre por estar disponible y muchas gracias a ti, Rodrigo. Gracias a Todd Mercer, embajador de Australia a Chile. Gracias a Patricio Donoso, presidente de la Cámara de la Construcción. Y les agradecemos a todas y todos ustedes que han querido ser parte de este interesante encuentro online. Y los invitamos a seguir participando de los encuentros que la Cámara Chilena de la Construcción, la Embajada de Australia en Chile y la Cámara Chileno-Australiana de Comercio, AUSCHAM, tiene preparado para ustedes. Muchísimas gracias y les contamos que toda esta conversación va a quedar arriba en la página de la cámara, así que la van a poder comple ver completa en ambos idiomas, en English and in Spanish. So thank you very much and good night. Buenas thank noches. You. Bye. Chao.